So, so just to give a little bit of background right. for anybody who does not know the illustrious, the incredible Neil Strauss, uh, and I say that in all seriousness, like when I have questions about writing, when I'm in the, my pit of despair with writing, this is the guy I call. Uh, so you've, what, six New York Times bestsellers? Seven? Seven. Seven. That's crazy. Yeah. Insane. Yeah, unstoppable. So I also wrote for a long time New York Times. Yeah, right? 10 years. Um, just a side note, you have a, uh, you have a letter on your, posted and framed on your wall. Yeah. What, can you tell people what that is? Yeah, I, I have this letter. Uh, when I was writing the New York Times one day, and I, it's, a, it's a hate mail from Phil Collins. <laughs> and I guess, and, and, the, and the, last, the last three words of the letter, were, or four words, were, well, Neil, you. <laughs> Um, and if it was, came from like, and I was hearing music, if it came from like Trent Reznor or someone, I'd be like, okay, that's just that dark person, but it came from Phil Collins. <laughs> and it was on like letterhead from the Peninsula Hotel. There wasn't all handwritten, not a single cross out. And I called the publicist to make sure that um, it was him. And I said, where was he staying? And she was like, the Peninsula. Um, so awesome. I framed it and put it on my wall. So there, there are rare moments of excitement when you're not like heads down writing. Uh, I, write, I was trying to be nice in the interview. I wasn't being yeah, mean or anything yeah. like that, so it was a surprise, by yeah. the way. I, I write, uh, my quota for writing is two crappy pages a day. Wait, so it must have, I mean, how many pages is the current book, though? It's 672 after cutting 250. So, so here, that doesn't add up. No, I know it doesn't. Okay. So I, I told you, I gotta keep this guy under control. So <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but I'll give you a Hannibal Lecter mask. But uh, th that was advice I got actually from uh, a really famous, well, not very famous, because they don't use his name, Ghostwriter. Uh -huh. He's written like 60 books. Right. And the analogy he used was, IBM, when their sales force was like the most dominant sales force in the country, right. they had the lowest quotas, mm -hmm. which seems really counterintuitive, but they yeah. weren't intimidated to pick up the phone. Right. And then they ended up exceeding those quotas. Right. So the crappy two pages a day was his recommendation for my quota, right. which of course, once you actually start writing, like Got the it. hard part for me is just like sitting down yep. and starting. Yep, I get it, I get it. And then it. once I'm into it, if it's like 12 pages, great. But if I don't write my two pages, I don't panic and go into the spiral of it makes sense because I was reading. It totally makes sense. It's totally mm -hmm. counterintuitive. I was reading something uh, about how to train yourself to floss your teeth every day, yeah. and it said only floss one tooth. Yeah. I said, I'm just going to floss one tooth. Yeah. Then you go up and you do it, and then you end up doing all your teeth, exactly. and then you can create that. But habit. it's easily winnable. Yeah. Right. So um, this is true with any habit. Right. Uh, but ugh, I want to jump in. Okay. Let's, let's, no, no. Let's let's, let's, let's get, get into it. I have, I have so many. Okay. Yeah. I know. I know. This is so amateur. I'm looking at these, but. Uh, Okay, I'll just add, this is a great question. So, I mean, you're getting these big advances, you have these big businesses. By the way, have... I get really small advances. Oh, you know what, this is actually a good point. Right. You ultimately, this, so we have a very different approaches to this. Well, right. I'll come back to that. Okay. All right, your books end up doing very well. Right. All right. And uh, you have these businesses and everything else. Uh, would love to talk about how you got started as a writer and like yeah. cut your teeth. Yeah. But we'll t let's talk about the advanced thing for a second. Okay. So we have completely different approaches. Yeah. So, so most authors want to get the biggest advance possible because they're humans and they're greedy, but they also uh, want the publisher to feel really committed. Like the more money they spend on the advance, the more obligated they feel to help, or so the rationale goes. But you're, you have a different approach. Yeah, my thing is I, like, I want a long-term relationship with my publisher or whoever I'm working with. So if I can make them successful, then they're gonna to wanna to have that relationship with me. Yeah. So I've always taken very low advances. And how, basically how a book contract works, it's not like the record business, you'd actually see the back end. I did an article once on the Backstreet Boys who, when they sold 25 million albums, didn't make a penny in royalties. In the book, basically once you earn out your advance, you start making money. What the publisher does to decide whether you're successful as an author is they look at their spreadsheet, um, and basically if your advance is so high that they didn't make any money, that was not a successful book, even if it was a New York Times bestseller. Yeah. So all my books are really, really successful for them because I know I trust, I mean, you write a book knowing or hoping it's gonna do well even if it's your first book. So I just, I'll take very little money on the front end, I'll yeah. assume that it's gonna do well on the back end and I'll get that money then. Yeah. And they'll look at their books and want a relationship with me. I really remember after like my second book, I had four contracts for future books already in line with the publisher. Yeah. Like, so the rest of my career is just done and yeah. set and I can quit my day job. So this is, yeah, totally different approaches, right? So I go for the big advance when possible. Right. Uh, but. This points out there is no one way, different ways, and a lot of it comes down to your personal psychology. Like right. we, <laughs> we have a lot in common, but we're pretty right. different in a lot of ways too. Yeah. Like I'm just a bull in a china shop. I'm just like, God damn it, Ugh! like <laughs> so aggressive, you know. Uh, Neil, not so much. Like you're much more like methodical and, and more rational about things. I'm more methodical than that's. Not, I can't believe anyone's more methodical than you about writing. You about are. writing. Yeah, so all right, writing. let's talk about the okay. the beginnings. Right. So I mean, like what were the breakthrough moments for you? 
uh, as a writer? Um, like, how did they? How did you get there? It's weird. I was thinking, and I was, I was talking to 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 Robert Greene, who who's yeah. a friend, and he has his book Mastery is coming out, and yeah. and uh, and uh, and we were talking about passion, how you know what your passion is. We both came to the same conclusion, which is two things. One is whatever you're doing when you're 11 or 12, that yeah. a school teacher or a parent to make you do is your passion. Yeah. And literally, when I was 11, I wrote a whole book, sent it to publishers. <laughs> Nobody and agents, and no one responded. Not a single person, and so I got used to rejection early, pretty early. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, who would not like an eleven-year-old writes a whole book and sends it to you? Who would not respond? It's what just a bunch mean. Of dicks. <laughs> I know. That's exactly. so, that's so <laughs> mean. Yeah. Wow. And I also found my parents sent me some some my all asked for all my childhood writings, and in second grade, I wrote like, when I grow up, I want to be a writer, and I want to write a million books. And I forgot that I'd ever done this stuff, and I forgot I ever wanted to be a writer in college, and you get distracted, and I got yeah. into music and all that stuff you get into in college, and then somehow just led back there. So people looking for their passions, I think that's the one thing. And the second answer, which goes to the advanced discussion, is what would you do if you didn't get paid for it? If your money was set, what would you do for work if you didn't get paid for it? And, yeah. You know, I would write some books I don't even make money on because I spend so much money, as you probably know yourself, uh, yeah, yeah. researching I mean, them. And I bought a second citizenship for uh, one of them. Yes, yeah, for another, oh, yes. Another emergency. Country. Yeah. Uh, I have an anecdote about emergency. It's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> Neil will... N- I've known, how long we know each other? Years and years now. Yeah. Neil will not tell me what his new books are about. No. <laughs> He's yeah. so damn paranoid about it. Right. He'll not tell me anything about his new books until it's like yeah. almost going to publication. Yeah. But uh, I remember uh, you, you wanted me to, to we, well, when you were doing the drafts for Emergency, and I was right. like, what is this? So you wouldn't tell me anything, so I was like, let me take some stabs in the dark, see if I can make him panic. So yeah. I was like, no, 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 what is it, some five flag stuff? Yeah, you know, I freak me out. <laughs> because it's like all about- Multiple citizenships, and all of a sudden he's like, <laughs> yeah. And what it's it, really obscure. Yeah, it's super obscure. Yeah. And so you you would FedEx, I think it was FedEx, yeah. printed sections of the book. You would never send me the whole thing for right. me to review. You wouldn't send me anything. It was, it was, it was great. And I have this hey. secret thing I'll do on books, um, which, is, uh, which is I'll do the draft and I'll say, I'll draft, I'll handwrite a draft, I'll say 9 slash 11 for the date. And then I'll code, for each day I'll do 9, 12, 9, 13 for a different person. <laughs> And then on page, I'll do that on the cover so I know whose it is. Then on page 11, because you got to be careful with like, yeah. you know, with, with, and then on that page, I'll put a little mark on that page. So I have a little code of, if it ever leaks out there. It's like the Da Vinci code, the Strauss yeah. code. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, but, uh, but, and the reason, by the way, I don't talk about it is because ideas are, you know, we no, know they're memes, memes and yeah, ideas yeah. are memetic. No, no, I totally get it. I, I know totally you talked to one person and psychologically they did studies and people forget the sources of their information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can read something in the New York Times yeah. or the National Enquirer. I don't actually disagree with that. Yeah. I'm just, I, I've become a little less stringent, but. Right. No, no, because uh, you told people what your book was like almost like th- oh, two weeks after, yeah, yeah. before our body came so, out. So I know we're bouncing around a little bit, but this right. is all very related. So part of the reason that I announce books early right. is I, I, will, I will use my audience to help determine what I should do. So I right. see what they guess right. I'm gonna focus on. And this is another thing we differ on, so I wanna yeah. hear what you do and I'll tell you what I do. So, all right, the, the first, so how do you decide what to write? Right. Uh, I never thought I was going to be a writer ever, so I didn't have the 11, 12 year old thing. Right. Uh, but I always, I had a number of teachers really heavily influence me, and so I thought, well, maybe, maybe someday I'll, I'll be a teacher. I really, like, early on, I was like, well, maybe like. By the way, what, what were you doing at 11 or 12? Were you like doing like little comic book penciler? I thought I was going to be a comic book penciler. Wow. And I was actually an illustrator for two years. Not many people know this. Right. Like, I, I paid for like my expenses and stuff in the first few years of college by. Uh, being the head graphics editor of the Princeton Tiger, so I did right. all the illustration. I also did some illustrations for a few uh, Princeton University books, and then bouncing. What a shitty right. job! Uh, but uh, <laughs> nobody like, nobody likes bouncers. Uh, but the, the 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 point being, you know, I wanted to. I thought I might come back and teach, and right. just ended up like this accidental career of, of writing ended up being the the tool for that. But yeah. I do not ask my readers what they want and then write that book. But I'll pick and I'll cherry pick little bits and pieces. Uh, but I think ultimately Steve Jobs said this, Henry Ford said it. Like people don't really know what they want. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yep. I so agree. it's like, what do you want? I want a faster horse, not a Model right. T. Yeah. A lot you know? of people will do that. They'll survey their audience and ask what they want, or think of what'll be big or what'll be popular. And the thing is, I talk with rock bands a lot about this a lot because I interview a lot of rock bands. I said, all your audience knows is what you've done before. Yeah, yeah. They don't know what you're going to do next. Yeah, yeah. So all they want is what you've done before. And if you keep doing what you've done before, they're going to get bored. Yeah, and you're going to get bored too. And you're going to get bored too. And so to me, it's like I, how I choose what I'm going to write about is I stay one, I really always try to stay one step ahead. Yeah. Um, but it's not even trying that. I write about what I care about the most yeah. in that particular moment of my life. And because it's going to have that passion. I mean, I talked to, I've seen people, I was talking to a writer today 
and uh, and he has over a million Twitter followers, yeah. um, and a very big platform. And he wrote a book that did not do very well, yeah. um, because I think he wrote what was a clever book everyone would like yeah, versus yeah. writing something he really, really cared about that was yeah. important to him. And literally, yeah. um, I think you can make anything interesting if you really yeah. care about it enough. If you care about that pillow and the story yeah. of that pillow and where it was made and how it was made and yeah. who made it and what their story is. Yeah, you, can, yeah. you can dive into anything if you care yeah. about it and make yeah. it interesting. John McPhee, just as a side note, is, is, a, is a great example of this. Uh, Michael Lewis, also another example, right? But Michael Lewis chooses big macro topics. Like, oh, of course that's interesting. John McPhee, Pulitzer Prize winner, I mentioned him before. He's written a book on oranges, wrote a, uh, at least a short story, maybe a book on Plymouth Rock, uh, wrote one on basketball, Bill Bradley, A Sense of Where You Are, great book. And uh, like an orange. I wrote one on hand carved canoes. Right. And there, you read it and you're like, my God. Wooden canoe is the most amazing thing yeah. I've ever heard in my life, you know. Yeah. But uh, and, and, and for me, by the way, that the, the key, like to me, the key of writing is to if this is it, which is if, it, if you guys want to write or anyone wants to write, is my first thing is I assume no one cares. Whatever I'm writing about, I assume no one cares about what I'm writing about. Nobody cares about me. Yeah. Nobody cares about what I have to say. No one cares about the things I care about. Yeah. And if you just go from the premise that nobody cares, and how can I make them care from mm -hmm. the first sentence, from the first paragraph, you know? at the end of that chapter, how I'm going to make them turn the next chapter. To me, my main goal is yeah. to keep it interesting for the people and assume no one's interested. Yeah. So you've sort of arrived at these different approaches uh, to writing. What was the first, to your mind, like the first writing piece that you did that kind of put you on the map? Where not like I've arrived, but you're like, okay, I actually, I actually could make this work. I could actually really be good at this. Or wow, I, get, I just got recognition for this piece. I mean, was, were there any sort of defining moments in your, in your career as a writer? Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know, I'm not, yeah. I mean, the things that I remember, I remember like I was like, but by the way, the best way to get involved, get started in anything is to be willing to work for free. Yeah, yeah. Internships, like to me, yeah. are the path to anything. And I mean, I really think being, there's definitely a lot of people who are entitled. Basically, I have so much to say, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> if you want to live in your passion, whatever your passion is, you have to be willing to not make money at it. Yeah. You want to do what you love, you got to do, you have to, you, you have a choice. You can yeah. choose money or you can choose what you love. The, Joseph yeah. Campbell has a great quote that I always use. I don't know if you guys know this. The, Joseph, Joseph Campbell, mm -hmm. so the, yeah, the, the, the hero with the thousand faces. Yeah, the great kind of professor of mythology. But he said the, uh, the insecure, have you guys heard this? The insecure way is the secure way. Um, you guys have heard that quote? And what it means basically is, you know, my parents, and I'm sure like most people's parents say, get a good job, try and make some money, make a good living. Yeah. And because they, they think that's secure if you make go and make money. But if you do a job and you make money, you lose that job. Yeah. Then you lose the money and you have nothing. Right, right, what right. What he says is if you choose your passion, yeah. it actually doesn't matter whether you make money or you lose money because you're always going to have your passion be happy. So it doesn't actually matter. And that's your safety net. Right. And, and, but the challenge of that is that it might be eight years or four years before you're actually making a living at it yeah. versus, versus something else. Yeah, this is, this is a common thread. I mean, if you look at you know, the, co the concept of sort of apprenticeship and like yeah. working for free, not being the lowest point on the totem pole, but actually the way you differentiate yourself so you can work with the most talented people. Yeah. Because like the most talented people are gonna know on some level that they have a lot to teach. Right. So they're not gonna feel compelled, at least this has been my impression with a lot of people, to like overpay somebody who has no experience. Right. They won't, and I th by the way, for people looking for mentorships, yeah. I found there are two qualities that maybe got those for me, looking back on it, which was one is be willing to work really hard and do anything. Yeah. Uh, B is to be non-threatening to that person. Yeah. You know, a lot of people come in and they want to be that person or take their job and feel entitled to it. And C is to show the potential to learn. Because yeah, yeah. everybody wants to, you know, even like we first met, you actually sent me your book proposal oh, yeah, for the four-hour right. work week is how we met. Yeah, yeah. way back yeah, in the yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, and, that's, that right. was our first contact, cold yeah. email. Yeah. And I sent him the proposal, I guess it was like Lifestyle Hustling at the yeah, time. Yeah, Lifestyle Hustling is what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> Horrible yeah. title, the worst. Yeah. Right. Oh my God, and like I mocked up a cover in the back cover and like it was pretty funny. But uh, the point being, I sent it and you actually responded, you, he responded yeah. and it was something like, yeah, great idea. Like keep going or something. It was like super, <laughs> super short, <laughs> right. super short. And then I was like, oh my God, Neil Strauss responded. Like, oh, like we're going to be pen pals. And then I responded, nothing. Like <laughs> radio silence, radio silence. Yeah. Until we reconnected like years later yeah. at, a, at a dinner in Los yeah. Angeles. And yeah. We ended up like sitting at the same table and I was like, you may not remember this. Right. But like it really meant a lot, meant a lot to me, you know? Yeah. And um, 
in any case. And so like being coachable yeah. though. Um, right. Yeah, it's being, it's being coachable and trainable and showing the potential yeah. to be better. But, uh, but you were asking that first piece. So anyway, I was interning at the Village Voice and spent like maybe nine months opening mail and all that other stuff and yeah. fact checking and copy editing. I was just in Chicago at a Public Enemy Sonic Youth concert. Okay. And there was a riot there and I just happened to be there. And so that was my thing. I just was in the right place in the right time and I got that first break and I wrote that piece and then I remember afterward like, the different New York papers like used my coverage for that for that for that thing, and, so and it that came was out first. with the Village Voice. It came yep. out on the Village Voice. That was back when like if uh, a weekly could still break news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. right, Very cool. Dailies can't even break news anymore. Oh, God, that's, yeah. Well, like be first or be accurate. Right? Yeah, like, uh, yeah. Uh, what? How has your approach to writing changed over the years? Uh, in terms of tackling, let's just say a book project, because right. I think a lot of people are interested in that. Like, yeah. What is the order of things, and how, how, how has it evolved over time? Yeah, I think it's really, I have a lot of thoughts on that, and I've, yeah. on the way down here, wrote, I, tried to, I tried to backward engineer it, and I hate talking about it, because yeah. I think if anyone does anything artistic or creative, there's some part that you don't want to analyze or think yeah, about. Yeah, sure, sure. But, uh, but, um, the best practices I'll, I'll say, I'll, that can yeah, be analyzed. Yeah, I'll say the, the best advice I have for writing, and I think you know this yourself, um, does anyone here want to write books? Who's, who's here? One, yeah, cool. Everyone else wants to do apps now. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, um, so yeah, the best, I'd, I'd say the best advice for anyone who wants to write a book is literally the best way to write a book is to have a, a looming, impending deadline <laughs> with hard, real world consequences yeah. for stakes. missing Stakes. Remember stakes, guys? Honestly. Yeah. 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 Did, did you talk about stakes? Yeah, you need yeah. stakes. Like stakes to I work. talked about it with diet, diet or, or yeah. S-T-A-K-E-S. Oh, yeah, stakes. Yeah. This is, yeah, it's not stakes. Stakes <laughs> like vampire stakes, yeah. but. Uh, for consequences. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think that... Um, and I know Something that a media coach said to me recently, they're like, you gotta, when you say steaks and you have a book called The 4-Hour Chef, they're going <laughs> to think you're talking about steaks. <laughs> exactly. I was like, ah! Oh. But, uh, but I think yeah. if, you, if you can't do it, you manufacture it. You yeah. talk about stick.com and, yeah, yeah. and things like that. But I really know that, that literally, you know, Tim's always, Tim will be calling and I'll be calling Tim saying, yeah. I got to get this in. I got like three months. I can't do, but if literally, if we didn't have those deadlines, you wouldn't have written three books never in some happen. amount of time. Yeah, it would never happen. Yeah. So, uh, so you have to, uh, so I'll do that. If a friend of mine wants to write a book I'll, and they want me to proofread or take a look at it, I'll say, I'll take a look at it, but what date are you going to get it done by? Because I'm going to hold you to it. And they'll say January. I said, if it's not done by the end of March, yeah. I'm not going to read your book at all, no matter what. Yeah. So I'll give consequences and deadlines to my friends. So it's yeah. a good way to write is to really, if, if you don't have a publisher or a deal or something like that, to yeah. find some real consequences that's yeah. externally imposed. And I would also just say for people who are like, ah, I'm not a writer. I, I still don't really consider myself a good writer. This guy's a good writer. I don't consider myself a good writer. Uh, but the process of writing is the fastest way, in my experience, to improve your thinking. So true. Because writing is thinking on paper. And it's pretty tough to like, improve your thinking in real time. <laughs> so yeah. you put it on paper, though. I remember uh, when... I did my first writing assignment for, for John McPhee's class and he, he handed our writing assignments back and he said to everyone, he's like, look, you guys are all good writers. I don't want you guys to panic. And we're like, well, we got it back. And there was more red ink than black ink that we right. put down. We're just like, what is this? That's great. And he was so methodical like at cutting out fillers. Right. Colorful nonsense. It didn't add anything. That's the other secret is yeah. having a good editor. Yeah. I think it's hard with the with the with the blog world, and you're yeah. writing your own blog. You don't have an editor, so you're doing yeah. a lot of writing. Yeah. But to me, I learn by having you know you learn by having an editors, and yeah. and again, if you're not writing somewhere where there's an editor, you can have a, a, a you know friends read your yeah. stuff. Yeah. But that, doing that feedback and internalizing that. Yep. Yeah. It's super important. What happened is that my grades in every other class improved in lockstep with my as my how my writing got tighter, which is really cool. So even if you don't plan on being a writer, it's really good training for just becoming a better thinker. Uh, yeah, I literally, I don't, I don't know what my conclusion is of a book yeah. or what my perspective or my thought on it is actually until I sit down to write it and have to organize those ideas. Yeah. yeah. I don't write my introduction or the conclusion until towards the end of a book. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't do yeah. my introduction because I feel like it'll lock me in stone. Right. And you and I both do something similar where... <clears throat> I don't, I don't assume that I have a lot of great ideas I can expound upon and make interesting. So what, what, uh, when people ask me, like, well, who are your role models? Like, uh, and they have their guesses on who they might be. And I always bring up George Plimpton, like, the, like the fir one of the first sort of experiential journalists who uh, Paris Review, and he would go like, be an amateur boxer and fight Sonny Liston and then write about it. Or go you know, 
be a quarterback for an NFL team, get his ass kicked, and then write about it. And I think the riot is a good example of that. Like, right. go out and find or do interesting things to provide yourself a context for writing. Yeah. And, uh, I, and I would also say take notes on your life. Yeah. Because you never know everything yeah. you're doing, everything you're experiencing is material for a book. If I didn't take notes every day on the things that were happening and that yeah. were interesting and all my thoughts and feelings about it, because yeah. every day you're growing, every day you're transforming, every day you're changing. What you think today, how you feel about things may not be yeah. the same as you think next week and oh, you want to yeah. capture it in that There's moment. There's so many cases where like now I'm just like, God, yeah. why didn't I like take notes yeah. on this or why didn't I like videotape that, you know, whatever. But speaking of taking notes, um, what's your process? So I mean, yeah, yeah, how, okay. how, do you, how do you capture notes? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, I mean, I, I think of a book like this. So, so the first process is I'll just take notes and I, I don't, with notes I'm not writing, I'm just vomiting out everything I remember, every thought I had, every feeling I had, every word someone said. If I can actually record things sometimes with yeah. permission, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll record them if it's an interview or sometimes if I know I'm doing the book and so I'm just gonna record this for posterity. Yeah. So I'll try and do that and I'll get someone to transcribe it. I actually have a medical transcriber transcribe stuff so she gets every single US based or somewhere detail, else? US based, US yeah. Based. Yeah, very I'm cool. Keeping it in, keep it, <laughs> keeping the economy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, um, so the first stage. So the first, and I'll, I'll tell you, this is this is what I kind of realized today, and this is how I do drafts. Is so, got all my notes. Yep. First draft is for me. Yeah. The first time, yep. everyone himself with a book, trying to write a great book, right away. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, I think everybody's just first draft. Not the first draft turned in, but the first draft you do. I, I would venture that I would think anyone who's a good writer, their first draft sucks. Yeah. You know, you just, you're trying to get everything down. And the point of the first draft is people get precious about it. They want to actually write a book. Yeah, yeah. And they want each page to be a publishable page. Yeah. If you do that, you're never going to pass the first chapter. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, I say the first secret is you can do everything for you and you get everything that you wanted to get in the book in that mm -hmm. book. So when you're done with the first draft, you basically have a giant stack of pages. This is a lecture that he's given me many times, yeah. <laughs> by the way. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And you need it. You yeah. need to hear it. Yeah. So you have a giant stack of pages. In the, Good thing about those pages, everything you want to say is in there, you know. Yeah. And now you just know that you now you got to start shaping, crafting yeah. that. And it's everything you want to say. Maybe it's not said right. Maybe there's too much there. Maybe there's stuff that is not going to end up there. But everything's in that ball now. It's not in your head anymore, swimming around in notes. Yeah, this is super, super important because one of the big stresses for me, keeping in mind, like when I graduated from college, I had to write a senior thesis, and it just about killed me. Like one of the reasons I took a year away from school is because like it was too insurmountable a task for me. Right. I was just overwhelmed, and I was like, I can't finish this thing. Senior thesis, and so I graduated. And I was like, I'm never going to write anything longer than an email ever again. Right. Didn't quite work out clearly, but I still have all that like insecurity and fear associated with big writing. And one of the sources of the stress was that I wanted to get like each page perfect before I moved on to the next. Right. And right. so I would constantly have all these different sources of stuff, as opposed to like, all right, make the first draft for you. You can put like notes in the margins. You can have TK. Right. Which we'll uh, come back oh, to. TK is my favorite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll come back to TK. <laughs> and then once you have that in one like working document, now you can you don't have all these different sources of stress. You have one thing to work on. So TK is uh, took, I didn't even know what that stood for until right. like a year ago. I was like, what the hell does this mean? Right. So what what people in publishing will do is if if they're writing and they need to find out like the age of someone or a date or whatever, they'll just put TK or like quote TK. So that they don't interrupt their flow, and they, then they can go back and they can fill in the blanks. So TK stands for to come, right? But that's TC. So why TK? TK because TK really doesn't appear in the English language. So if you want to do a search through your document, you can jump. Oh, I didn't know why. Yeah, yeah. I just was, it was a weird way to say it. To yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no, no. It's so you can search and you can find all the things you need to fill in right. without having to search through the document. Yeah. So 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 when I'm writing and I really want to just get it out, if I start to stumble over a word like I, you know, you know, I'm sitting with. Tim, in, in that TK shirt, because I described that that collar and that neck right, on right, that shirt. Right. I don't know. I'm not that good a writer. So, 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 so I write, you know, in, in his, you know, TK shirt, yeah. and you know, and on the TK couch, and I just want to get it through, and yeah. then later I can fill in whatever that is, because it'll help me just spit out everything that's in my mind. I, I want to talk about the second. So, yeah, so, yeah. So the first draft is for you. The second draft is for the reader. Mm. So, I'm, and so once I've got everything in there, I'll go through now, and then I'll think about what's that reading experience like, mm. and write it for the reader to read, and that's the point where you know you kill your babies. Yeah, yeah. When there was that thing that you did, and you researched that for, for a week, and this was so important, you thought this was gonna be the heart of the book, and then you read it, and you're like, you know, it's not that interesting. You don't spend all that time <laughs> writing it, and all that time researching it. <laughs> those are it. the worst. Yeah, those are the, yeah that, that gives you the most, <laughs> the most uh, headache. Uh. Uh, so the second draft is for the reader, uh, and, and really, you're, at that point, you're taking out 
anything, basically a book when you're done, yeah. should be such that you can't remove a word or a paragraph or a chapter yep. um, and the book still be okay and intact. Yeah. It should be such that you even remove a paragraph that is actually ruined. Everything there has to be yeah. essential. I really think there's this, the book I'm writing now, there's this chapter, I love it, I wrote it, it's so important, so well written. Literally, I can remove it and the book's the same, so it's gone. Yeah, yeah. So, and this is what a lot of people don't do, the third draft. Okay. Um, and by the way, when we're talking drafts, it probably may, may be multiple in the draft, but I think the third incarnation, let's yeah. say. So, first one's for third, first incarnation for you, second for the reader, third is for the hater. Ah. So what I do is when I'm all done with my books, so I've like done it for my like reader, that. my ideal reader. Yeah. The third time I think, what are the critics going to say? What's, uh, you know, somebody who's just looking to this to, to, to pick holes apart yeah. in it. I try to, I'll try to hater proof the book. Uh. Like almost like, what I love about like, you know, Eminem. Yeah, yeah. Is that you can't really criticize him because he's always put put all your criticisms in the songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's not there's well, you it's know, like the the, yeah. the end of uh, help me out here. God, six mile. What was it? No, not six mile. Eight, mile. That, eight mile. Yeah. When he he like takes all the insults from the guy he's battling and right. puts it into his own. Exactly. And so he's like, yeah, ah. yeah. yeah. That's, exactly. That's a really good. So I'll point. do that. So I'll just think, okay, that person's gonna make that apart. Okay, I gotta answer that argument within the book. Uh, I have to answer that within the book. So like literally, that. when when the ruse came out, good or, good or bad. Yeah. Uh, it's, all, it's, all, it's already all there. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's that third read. I like that. And then that. you really feel like you have something airtight. It's awesome. How all are we right, doing Tim, on time, guys? Yeah. The internet is absolutely loving having you here, Neil. Um, oh, good. We have so the many. Is a person now? <laughs> 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 Mr. Internet has questions for you. The internet. We represent okay. the yeah. internet. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, but we have, so we have a number of questions, but we're going to start in our studio audience okay. with, yeah. with Amanda. And you represent the internet. And what, what do you represent? They also represent the duality. The internet. It's a, it's a duality internet internet the internet the internet internet. relationship. So so they're <laughs> manning, manning the webs. Okay. Well, when you sit down to write, do you do it at like the same time and in the same place? Mm. Great question. I think yeah. one of the things I wanted to get to, I'm glad you asked that, is time management. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, when Tim said I'm a, you know, I'm very methodical about time management because it's so hard to do. So the first thing, I, I can, I'll give you a couple important life-changing tips for anyone trying to do something creative on the computer. So number one thing there's a, uh, is uh, no email in the morning. Like yeah. number one thing is there's a program called Freedom mm -hmm. that I downloaded. Yeah. Uh, that, and it says, you know, I love the word freedom uh, because that's really what it is. It says, how many minutes of freedom do you want? You say whatever it is, 90 minutes, and then you cannot ac the, access the internet for 90 minutes. There's no unlock code. People are gasping. You're all going to use it. Yeah. yeah. There's no unlock codes. The first thing I do is, uh, is phone. I give it to someone else or put it in a drawer somewhere. It's best if I give it to someone else. Uh, internet goes off, um, and I commit to that amount, a certain amount of time. I really have my days structured. How I currently do it, I'm changing a little bit, but what I currently do is Mondays, I do every meeting I have I do on a Monday. I do exactly the same thing. Just no, it's funny. Monday is my like really? nonsense minutia day where I just take care of all of that extraneous stuff that's hitting the shield. Yeah. Yeah. It's, anyway. fun. it's so funny. Every, every meeting, every interview, everything, it's just books on a Monday. Mondays are crazy. There might be 12 hours of this stuff. But then Tuesday to fr Friday, I just write. And so, uh, so I turn that stuff, stuff off, and I try to automate anything that causes anxiety. For example, lunch is a pain. And what, like, what I want for lunch today, do I menus, do I order out, do I make food? So I literally have it, do you do this too or something? No, I remember we did this like uh, very bromantic uh, retreat to yeah. write in yeah. Malibu, you remember yeah. this? So we're both writing, and just like the degree of stress that like having to go out and have a meal caused you, right. it was like, Pure hilarity. It was also because I was being a guinea pig for the four hour No, I know. He was also, eating, he was also, also being forced to eat like 80 grams of glutamine a day. Yeah. And he was just kind of yeah. grumpy because I was making him do leg presses to failure. The training and the, that was nothing compared to the eating to failure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, long, long story. Yeah. But yeah, so, so continue. Yeah, you autom automate um, meals. So, so basically, anything that I notice, also, you have a certain amount of reserves of decision making power a day. After a certain amount, supposedly you can't make more decisions, you just get fatigue. A lot of people spend a lot of that power on, on lunch. So what I do is I've just chosen the five places where I like to eat the most, and I just get those meals delivered like clockwork. Each of those days, I just don't think about it. The food just comes. Uh, so really automate those things. Sorry, sorry. Literally, what? I, one more anecdote I have to tell people. So eating to failure. So trying to get Neil to gain weight. <clears throat> and he told me a story about Neil Bites and how like, <laughs> he'd have these little tiny bites. His parents were like, oh, stop taking Neil Bites. And so we'd be sitting there at like a restaurant having our like, I remember this one time we are having these like cocoladas or like yeah, coconuts yeah, yeah. with <laughs> umbrellas and I'm like rice eat rice and so I'm like feeding him yeah, like, yeah. rice and everyone's yeah. like what's yeah. going on here it's very <laughs> romantic yeah, anyway. uh, yeah I'm, a, I'm a slow eater <laughs> yeah I'm a disgusting like walrus so yeah um so uh, so so uh, so 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 my thing is that I is compartmentalizing that if you're gonna check your email check it from four to five 
Uh, they have a, there's a, someone wrote a book which I never read, but it's called Never Check Your Email in the Morning. <laughs> you don't, I don't know if you need to read or not, but just know the title and it's really great. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's, it's great advice. The thing is, with time, is to become proactive about time instead of reactive. Because mm -hmm. I know so many people, you can't do anything because you're getting a you know, message on Facebook and then you're getting a, um, you know, an email and then you're just reacting to that because it feels like you're getting something done. At the end of the day, you got nothing done. Yeah. So I, what my thing is, I'm really, and everyone knows that I'm proactive about that to, to the degree that, um, uh, by the way, I have Facebook and Twitter blocked on my computer. Yep. Uh, what I did is I downloaded Intego Content uh, I think it's a Content Barrier, whatever it is. No, it, there, yeah, there's Net Rescue Nanny. Time can be used at yeah. um, Net Nanny, Net Nanny is, is can be used one, to block I, specific sites. Yeah, and I had someone else put in their password for those sites, so I didn't even know the password, so I couldn't get to Twitter or Facebook if I tried. Um, so finding those things that are those, are those and putting walls between you and them or limiting them in certain ways. There's one other thing I was going to say was, um, oh, which is, Friends can be a pain in the ass if you're trying to be creative. And if you have more than seven friends and everyone wants to see you one day a week, what do you do? Yeah. So another thing I want to say is that I do a, a Wednesday night dinner party. Yeah. Mm. So if my friends want to see me, I'm like, great, Wednesday. If someone wants yeah. a meeting who I'm not sure about, Wednesday night. So Wednesday night, we, uh, we all go to a restaurant uh, and, and basically whoever I want to see or catch up on, I'll, I'll see them there and then maybe afterward I'll break off with my closer friends. But that way I can see everyone, people who I want to meet with, but I don't want to really take the time for a lunch or meeting one-on-one. -on -one. I just bring them there. If I like them, I talk to them a bunch. If I don't, I put yeah. them far away. So you I, know, do, I do yeah. the same thing, actually, uh, but I do it on Fridays. Oh, it's so, so funny. So I'll do like a Friday kind of happy hour thing. Yeah. Uh, so that, because dinners can be like three, four hours, right? Right. So I'll do like a happy hour drinks thing with like five to 10 people or whatever. Yeah. And I'll be like, oh, we're going to I'll introduce all you guys. It'll be awesome. But I mean, the practical implication of that is that you're taking these people you do want to meet with, but you don't have time yeah. if you want to get anything done. So yeah. you're batching it together. Yeah, but the real thing is to be non-reactive, be in control of your time, and to have things compartmentalized, you know, where they can belong. The other important thing, by the way, for writing is just do some, something physical and healthy every day. Yeah. Like, even that, that hour, hour and a half you do it is going to give you that much time and clear-headed thinking. Yeah. Cool. How many, how many pages do you write a day? It's a good question. Um, so, this guy's a machine. Yeah, um, so I, I, do, here's, I do 10 pages a day writing. And then when I'm proofreading, the first proofread will be 20 pages a day to proofread. The next page will be 40 pages a day to proofread. So it kind of goes like that. Mm -hmm. I think what people don't factor in, the art of writing is not is in the proofreading afterward, not in writing it. Yeah. To me, what makes the book, good book, the book good is, yeah. is those parts afterward. I think of it like a shirt, like a really wrinkled shirt. And you just keep going over it with the iron until all the wrinkles are gone. Yeah. And that's it. the first incarnation is an ugly wrinkled shirt. And it's that, that's that ironing process that makes it great. And there's another thing I'll do. Um, and I'm just spitting out stuff because yeah, I know go, we're going on time and no, no, I want to no. get a lot of stuff in. Um, and then people can ask questions and Mr. Internet can ask what he wants. <laughs> he or she. He <laughs> and she. Uh, oh. So, um, so uh, oh yeah. So, what were we talking about? <laughs> I got so much time. You're ironing uh, wrinkles on the shirt. Writing ironing wrinkles, shirt, proofreading. Wrinkle. Oh yeah. Another thing, here's the thing I'll do that I don't think, I don't know anyone else who does this, but this is the key piece of uh, writing a book for me. I'm is when I feel like, I do it just to annoy you. Okay, no, no, yes, okay. You probably do. <laughs> no, no. People figure out things by themselves. Yeah. You know, like it's, you find out that you figure out these strategies for yourself and someone could have just told you that, yeah. told you them yeah. three years ago. Okay. When I'm all done with a book um, and I pick up a friend like this, because I'll call a friend or have a friend come over and I'll read them my entire book mm. from front to back, maybe not on one sitting. And I read them that whole book to make sure it's interesting. And they don't even need to respond. I know when I'm losing them. And I know when I'm bored. If they're bored, I'll just mark that passage and I'll be like, I'll go mm -hmm. over it. That's Another great. thing is, so I'll literally read the whole thing out loud. If I'm losing someone for some part of it, and I just know it, I'll just mark it. You can just tell. You don't even need their okay. feedback. Another thing I'll do is I'll make, I'll send key copies of the book with my secret numbering system <laughs> to, to uh, you know, to say 15 people. They don't need to be writers. They don't need to be authors. They don't need to, need to be anything. And I'll get their feedback. And some of their feedback I'll recognize as good and that I'll make it. But sometimes five people will make the same point. And then even if you don't agree, you've got to really consider it because mm -hmm. they're probably right. And actually, just on feedback, too, real fast, uh, I'll, I'll add just a few thoughts. Because we, we have a pretty similar process. Right. And with this last book, I mean, I, I was basically taking like the three years that I took to do the four-hour body and compressing it into six months. I do not recommend it. Couldn't be prouder of the book. I think it's arguably the best of my three books. But... Uh, I needed a lot of proofreaders. And as proofreaders, I want people who are either better writers than I am or better thinkers than I am. I don't, <laughs> and uh, the, I found actually like law students and lawyers to be really good. So I'll give you brutal feedback. Uh, the other rule I had was that <clears throat> if one person hated something, I wouldn't necessarily take it out. But if anyone loved something, it stayed in. Hmm. 
So like I need right. a, I needed a consensus to remove something, but I only needed one person to really love something to keep it in. And uh, the other thing I would say is that just from a, like a practical standpoint, a tool-based standpoint, I use, and this is not because I'm associated with, with a few of these companies, but I use Evernote to do all my research gathering. So pulling things offline, taking photographs of like labels, mm -hmm. taking photographs of business cards, people, whatever, like all of that gathering is done in Evernote. So it's in one place. And then I do my, my drafting in a program called Scrivener, which I have no association with, used for like by a lot of playwrights and screenwriters. I use it for screenplays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really good because then I don't have, first of all, Word, hate it, it always crashes. So instead of having like 100 Word documents, I have one Scrivener file where I have all of my chapters in this like table of contents and my research. So I can actually look at my notes in one, like at the bottom of the screen while I'm writing at the top, which saves me tens and, and possibly hundreds of hours at the end of the day. Uh, the, then I use, I use uh, Dropbox for sharing really big files with my teams like in New York, San Francisco, wherever. We have people all over the planet working on this thing. A lot of photos and videos. Um, if they send me something for feedback, like uh, illustration or photograph, layout, I'll use ScreenFlow to record a video. It's so much faster than like trying to type out an email or do anything else. I'll use ScreenFlow to like point out everything and then I'll upload that to Dropbox and share it with them. Um, instead of using email, because here's the problem, right? You don't want to check email, but then right. like everyone on the publishing team and all the publicists want to communicate with you via email. What do you do? Uh, I use Basecamp. So I use Basecamp so that even if they're using email to reply to everything, all I have to do is log into Basecamp to see what's most important. Yeah, by the way, and another thing with communication is I have a tiered system. So I have one email that uh, is super secret and only the people I need to contact have it. My publishers, my parents, my girlfriend, that, you know, only about 20 people have it. 21, yeah. Tim has it. Yes. <laughs> um, but I, because I, if anyone knows not to overuse it, it's Tim. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, and my phone too. And then I have another email that's just a, that's a wider one that kind of everyone has and I'll check that once every couple days. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then, uh, and then same with my phone. I have a number that literally almost nobody has. And then I have a number, another kind of general number that I'll just check when I'm home. So I think, especially these days, you really got to limit the channels mm -hmm. through which people can communicate with you. Okay. And I also do my editing. I do my, f my first note taking via hand, drafting via Scrivener, and for every draft, I print it out and I actually go through it by hand. I just find them better, I'm faster, and I can like connect the dots without having to scroll and whatnot. I just find it a lot easier. And you outline, you don't, you outline? I, I don't you, outline. You do not outline, yeah. and yeah. you do outline, but you don't do the, front, the first and the last, right? I do outline, okay. but it's, for me at least, I actually view my job, I'm kind of a, a I take a cheat approach, in, in a sense. I spec out all of the crazy things that I want to try. And that's my first outline. And then I do it, and you just don't know where it's going to lead. Right, you know, yeah. You have no idea. And that's part of the fun. Because ultimately, my opinion is, if the book is not at least fun to research, it's not going to be fun to read. Like, if you hate every step of the process, and you're like, but, you know, the market says this should be really popular and the timing's right, people are going to hate it. Yeah. And, and, the thing, and the thing about writing and interruptions is I read that if someone interrupts you for, in work, anything you're doing, it takes 20 minutes to get back yeah. to where you were. Yeah, yeah. And especially there's a, that, that flow process when you're mm -hmm. writing. Yeah. I think it's really important to not have interruptions get in flow because it might take three hours of staring at the computer, yeah, no, just exactly. doing nothing, typing whatever, and then you hit that flow and that's when you do good writing. Sometimes you're just putting words down, other times you're really writing and mm -hmm. you're like connected there and you just yeah. don't know when or where it's going to happen. You got to just create that space because yep. so you get interrupted when you're in flow, views. you're that's, screwed. That's why I do all my interruptible stuff during the day, interviews, research, online, blah, 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 blah. And I do my synthesis, my writing, starting at like 10 p.m. when people are less likely to interrupt me. So like a lot of writers I know get their like writing done from like 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. Now what I mean by that is they either start late, stay up really late, which is what I do, go to bed like 5 a.m., not the most social thing in the world, or they'll wake up really early, yeah. like 5 a.m. and write from 5 to 8, and I have to do that because I trust my behavior more when everyone else is sleeping than my self-control when everyone's awake. Um, so speaking of interrupting. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that was like one question. But you get two writers talking the, about writing and the, you're not going to yeah. So uh, we've got oh, only like three or four minutes left. Uh, okay. So we'll take a quick we'll question. We'll do a speed round of that. We'll take a quick question from, from the internet because yeah. we are the voice of the internet. We will edit um, ourselves. Like, yeah. And then I think Corey has a question here in the back. So okay, right. let's go ahead and go. Um, 
Selenart is saying, when writing, do you visualize one person or type of person as your reader? Hmm. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 guess, I guess the quick answer is, uh, is uh, yeah, I mean, in that second, the first time, again, it's for me, and I don't, I don't visualize the reader at all, because it's gonna be you. And the, and the second thing is, that, that reader is somebody who's a bored person not interested. Usually, I'll, sometimes I'll picture my parents. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually, totally opposite approach, I do write for very specific people. Right. So I'll write the book, that like, you know, I'm good friends with, let's say, Kevin Rose, or like, I'll think of like, Neil, or like, Ryan Holiday, say. And like, I will ask myself, like, would this pass muster for these people? And I try to write the book that I would want to read. Also, like, is this filling a gap where I would want to buy this book? If so, I just assume they're gonna be people who have some similarities to me. Maybe it's age, maybe it's living in San Francisco, whatever, who will also buy the book. Yeah, that's um, true. I'll write the book for me. That's really true. That's, a, that's so right on. I'll write the book that I wanna read. Yeah. Or I will, yeah, or the book, and the, or the book I need. Yeah. Yeah, right. Cool. All right. right. Corey, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so, one of the things I really love about both of you guys is that when you're going after a new task or a new skill, and this applies to writing and beyond, um, you fully immerse yourself in the research material. You know, uh, Neil in the game, you know, you start researching Brando and Streetcar Named Desire and uh, Mickey Rourke in that uh, movie from the 80s, I forget what it's called. Uh, everything, it was, I mean, there you could everything, right? Everything, right? Yeah, yeah, books, everything. And then uh, you as well with your research material with, for the chefs, I'm sure you studied a lot of chefs and, and beyond. Um, how do you filter out, you know, good material from bad material to study? Because right now, more than ever, we live in a time where there's just so much information. Mm -hmm. How do you select, as uh, Tim says, the 20% of material that'll give you the 80% of results for your writing or for yeah. skill acquisition? It's so true. There, yeah. There's a form of procrastination called perfect preparing. Yeah. And you spend so much time preparing and gathering data, it's, it becomes a form of procrastination after a while. So again, the simple answer is probably exactly what Tim said. Is and by the way, so the, so the gentleman talking, Corey, showed me earlier like a book he had yeah. of the things he wanted to do in his life. And one was meet Tim Ferriss, which he did. The other one was have a drink with Neil Strauss. And I'm not gonna be around tonight, but I had them grab a beer. Nice. Beer, so we awesome. can we can have that drink awesome. together. Oh, nice. <laughs> that is awesome. That's great. All right. That yeah. is fantastic. So, oh, and you have a drink with both of us. You, you can, you can, yeah. All, right, All you yeah. need is uh, Megan Fox here, and you've done your whole book. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, this is great. So, uh, yeah, I think you got to, one of the keys is knowing when you're done, when you've got enough, yeah. and also only going to the best stuff. Yeah, and for me, the eighty twenty analysis is done. Uh, All right, man. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. All right. Cheers. So. So I only choose things that I am interested in doing. And then, so at least, even if it doesn't make it into the book, it was something fun, something yeah. worth doing. Like I went down this huge rabbit hole with like DNA testing and like how do I hide my identity and like I did a bunch of DNA tests like as Brad Pitt and did all this crazy <laughs> stuff. Talked to like genetic weapons engineers at like nuts, right? And it was one of those things where it's like, oh, it's so awesome, like right. how you get like, like pre preloaded credit cards at Safeway, so no one knows. Blah 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 blah. And at the end, it was like not useful for the reader. Right. The cool thing is you got a blog, though. Yeah, and by the way, like, this is how you rationalize the things you're going to cut. You're like, I got a blog, yeah. or you're like, I always say I'll put it in the paperback, and then I never put it in the paperback or the or the right. digital book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and then once you have all of those experiences, that's when you cut it down. Mm -hmm. But you have to go out and you have to have them before you know what's actually interesting. Yeah. And, and yeah. But that's like the benefit of I think our approach in so much as we immerse ourselves. It's like we're learning a lot and having fun even if the book never succeeds. And we're getting it firsthand, and I think that's the key is, yeah. I mean, I read the third-hand stuff, I'm, or the second-hand stuff on my way to meet the first-hand person on the plane or yeah, something, yeah. but to me, I'm always getting it firsthand. If I'm doing a book on a subject, I'm gonna ask everybody about it. I think this is true for anything you want in life. They talk about the power of intent, but more than that, there's the power of putting it out there. And so anything I'm working on, I'll literally, even though no one knows what I'm writing about, all my conversations are about that. I'm asking everybody. I'm out there surfing. Which I'm makes to me a guy. crazy. <laughs> I'm like, just tell me what your book is about. Yeah. Uh, I'll yeah. even give people like, like, te like, I'll lead people in the wrong direction. I'll purposely do misinformation and steer them in the wrong direction. Okay, so yeah. just so he doesn't seem like the only one who's paranoid. So when I did, I think it was the first announcement for the four hour body, I used a, uh, a different title. I called it like the guide to becoming superhuman. Right. And then I put a bunch of fake stuff in there, 
as red herrings because I knew people would be like squatting on URLs. Right, right. Doing all these yeah, so I didn't want off. people to like grab all of the domains and Twitter handles and everything, which they did, but they had the wrong title. Right. Uh, but I did want to get feedback from, so this is important. Not only do I put it out there because I want feedback from my audience, I put it out there so that I, if people are in my audience, we're like the best in the world at that, that right. they then reach out to me. Yeah. Which is how I connected to the Linea in Chicago. Right. Is Nick Kakonis is one of the co-founders, an amazing, amazing guy, reached out after I made the announcement about the 4-Hour Chef, and he's like, hey, if you ever want to come check out Linea, come Great. check it out. That's awesome. One of the and best restaurants ever. So, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. so having people actually reach out to me, but not giving them like the nitty-gritty yeah, yeah, details yeah, exactly. so they can screw you up. Yeah, or yeah, or rip you off, especially with the yeah. Kindle now. Like someone could put a Kindle book out three days later, yeah. with uh, and the uh, and the which other, which is what they actually right. tried to do. Like it was, oh, it makes me crazy. Yeah, but yeah, you, you have to learn to deal with uh, people squatting. On another stuff. another thing about writing, by the way, don't think about publicity, marketing, title till you're all done. You know, people. That's another way of form of distraction. It's like, how am I going to market this? Yeah. What's my publicity plan going to be? Just write the freaking yeah. book first. Yeah, yeah. Marketing's very no, yeah. Yeah. tantalizing way, way to procrastinate. Way. <laughs> all right, all right. So we got an extra five minutes or so. We're going to okay. move the language segment to right after lunch. No problem. Okay. There's a language we segment just... next. How appropriate? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This Etiquette is true. and language. Yes, yeah, right. exactly. You can stay for it, Neil. Oh, yeah. okay. uh, we have another few questions oh, from the internet. Let's finish it off. Another cheers there. Frank Pierce, Neil, Frank Pierce says, how do you stop a writing session? And when you stop, how do you get out of your ultra-concentrated state of mind? Oh, how do you stop a writing session? Really? Yes. That's a quality problem. Like, yeah. I will, if I'm in a writing <laughs> session and it's going, I won't stop you it. And even stop. people know who I have plans with. I'm like, if, I, if I'm in it, yeah. I might not be there. That's yeah. another way, this way secret is don't, never commit to plans. Say, I've got another engagement, but I will try my hardest to be there. That way, if you don't show up, they expect you not to show if you show up, you're a hero versus yeah. being pissed. But anyway, so, so the answer is I won't stop it if, 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 if I'm going. If I'm I have the same exact policy. Uh, so it takes me, and from what I've seen in Silicon Valley with pro, like really good programmers, or just programmers in general, it takes them like a good hour just to get to the point where they're moving. And if you build up a bunch of momentum and who knows, you're like just sleep deprived enough or just drunk enough or whatever where it's actually working, you, like, I don't stop. I will go until I face plant. Like yeah. I will, like if, if I start at 10 and it's like four in the morning or five, sun's coming up but it's still going, I'm like, man, this might not come back for me. Might not come back for another three days. Like I'm just right. gonna go. And another key by the way is to, if you're gonna exercise or do something physical, do it in the middle of the writing or sometimes right afterward uh, because you wanna keep your head. You gotta keep your head in what you're doing. And your best ideas are gonna come to you actually when you're not writing, when you're in the shower, when you're driving, yep. when you're jogging. Uh, and then always write it down. As soon as you have that idea, you have to write it yeah, down. I always yeah. travel Otherwise with like a little gone. like a moleskin notebook. Always, right. always, always. I used to actually carry like a little notebook and a necklace around my neck and a pen there, yeah. and I would just grab it and write it down. Yeah, because if you will not remember. If you're like falling asleep and you're like, oh, well, I should do this tomorrow morning, like that great headline or that great subchapter, you're not going to remember. I'll yeah. sleep with a notepad and a pen near my bed. Yeah. If I do it, I'll just, if I wake up, yeah. I'll just I'll just write it down. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a couple of resources for writing. I'd love to get your thoughts. A yeah. um, couple of books that really helped me on writing well was, was really helpful to me way back in the day. Uh, Bird by Bird, I talk about it all the time, but just for like the psychological self-loathing and all that stuff, uh, self-doubt, whatever, which journalists, I feel like trained journalists suffer less from, um, but I, I could be wrong about that. Bird Only when you're doing screen. journalism because someone yeah. else is going to be loathing after they read yeah, that versus the ones yeah. that that's about you yeah. and you're going to be, yeah, that's no, true. I think, that's I think as a, when I was journalism, you never think that because really you're on a deadline. You're no, it's train. like you until 5 p.m. And you're like, oh, right. okay, well, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't have time for self-loathing. Right. Like, when you're doing, but you're doing a book, you totally doubt it because the book, man, you'd like, you really you pour your heart into it it's the whole you. freaking year it's you. and no one may read it. And yeah. yeah. Well, it's like when you made your jump from sort of writing about other people to writing about yourself. I mean, that was, yeah, I would imagine psychologically that changes a lot. Yeah, and I really imagine, I just, yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, it's tough, it's super tough. Okay, cool, any and, other And that's by another thing, there's a key that, um, um, we're not even asking the questions, we're just answering no, no, questions that don't yeah, exist. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, by the way, my resources, what I do when I'm reading is, I just try to read great writing. Right yeah, now I'm reading, yeah, yeah. I mean, right now I'm reading Nabokov or something like that. I'm not, I'm writing non, you know what I mean? But yeah. I, I just try to read the best writing I can because I feel like, and I would do that, before I wrote for Rolling Stone, I got my first Rolling Stone assignment. I went and before I sat down to write, I read like five Rolling Stone features just to brainwash myself and try and get in that mode. So I, I actually do the same thing. Uh, if there was a, a long time where I tried to write, I had, I, I had writers I thought were incredible and I would try to emulate them, but their style was too far from mine, right? Um, so again, John McPhee, like 
coming into the country just <laughs> makes me want to cry. Like his stuff is so good. I'm like, I could never write like that. Uh, Brigade de Cuisine about cooking. Oh my God, amazing short story. In any case, I cannot be him, right? But stylistically, my voice is actually pretty close to like a Kurt Vonnegut. So I started reading a lot of Kurt Vonnegut. I started reading a lot of Kurt Vonnegut. And I was like, okay, let me write this. Like if I'm blocked, forget about Tim Ferriss, forget about the reader. Right. I'm just going to write two pages as if I were Kurt Vonnegut. Like, how would he write this? And oh, interesting. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And, and then yeah. it's just a psychological trick to get you into putting words down. But it's funny. If I find an author I love, like a fiction writer, I'll, I'll trace it backward. Like, if you take Bukowski, then you read John Fante, then you read, like, Newt Hampson Hunger, or something, they all, like, they're, they're just 100, you know, some are 40 years apart, some are 100 years apart, just actually imitating. You can tell they found each other's book and did exactly what you did. Yeah. 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 All right. Great. Okay, we have a question from C. Trout, who uh -huh. wonders, uh, do you have an opinion on building a book through gaining credibility via blog versus writing first and then using blog and ebooks as spinoffs? I'll let you answer that one first. I mean, I have my thoughts, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Okay, so the question was, do you want to either get credibility versus a blog or then write and get... Blog to book or book to blog? Right. Bog, yeah, that's I got a great it. summary. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think we might be opposite gotta here. Get this away from me. Yes, <laughs> I know. Like, I wanted to pour more. It's way too early for this. <laughs> I know. The end of this is going to be like slurring his words. Yeah. <laughs> and then another thing. <laughs> um, so I, I think I think my simple answer for that is that's a good example of like putting the horse before the cart. So I wouldn't even start thinking about how I'm promoting or doing it. I would just start writing my book. So my thought, if a, if a blog is going to discipline you to get your book written and have those deadlines, then I'd go blog to book. For, for now, I wouldn't think about marketing and promotion. Literally, you can do it on both ends. For me, I like to keep my books a big secret and a big surprise, and I like when my book comes out for it to feel like an yeah. event and, and, and also to maybe break a story. I want my books actually to break a, you know, tell a story that hasn't been told before and break that. So I like to keep that surprise going. But I think some people can use those bot blogs, not for early promotion, but to motivate themselves to get writing done on deadline and get oh. that feedback. Uh, the last thing I'll say on that is, um, it's funny. Here's the thing about publishing for people who want to get published. It, this is kind of depressing. All they really care about now in publishing get a book deal is what is the size of your platform. Yeah. Like literally, if you have enough Twitter for followers. Not for nonfiction. Yeah, yeah. And Facebook followers. Um, you know, or you, if you can just prove, if you can prove, and this is kind of what you did in your proposal in a way. Yeah. You know, for your for for a book, because yeah. you know, if you can prove that you can sell ten thousand copies of a book, that's it. Yeah, you'll sell, it. you'll sell it. If you can prove to a publisher that you will sell ten thousand copies, you will probably get yeah. a book deal. Yeah, and what I just on book selling real fast. Actually, yeah, maybe I guess we haven't really talked too much about this, but it, if you get an A list agent, you'll sell your book. Uh, so step one, from my perspective, is getting an agent. Not because I can't sell books on my own. I don't want to deal with all the battles that you will always have with any publisher over certain aspects of the end product. Yeah. I don't want to deal with it. So like Steve, my agent, who's awesome, like went to Harvard Divinity School, raised Mennonite, like plays in a jazz band, really cool guy, also knows the business because he ran the P&L for a bunch of arms of HarperCollins. Which is profit and loss. Yeah, sorry. So if they're like, well, we'd love to, but we can't do this, he's like, Really? Like, right. <laughs> I know where you print your books. Of course it costs that much. You know? yeah. So uh, that's just a point on, on agents real fast. And publishersmarketplace.com is where you find a lot of information on that. So blog to book, book to blog. I did book to blog, quite frankly, because I didn't know what the hell a blog was. And I thought because the publisher was going to be doing, wanted to control all these various pieces, the only thing left for me to play with was online. So I was like, I guess I should figure out what a blog is. Yeah. And it started that way. And uh, if... I think that blog to book, not from a promotional standpoint, but from a writing standpoint, makes a lot of sense. It, because if you cannot write a blog post a week that's 500 to 750 words, there's no way in hell that you should write a book. No way. And so to just test the waters to find, like, do you actually enjoy writing on any level? Uh, I think the blog is a useful tool. WordPress just just to give an unsolicited piece of advice, there are plenty of blog platforms as far as like out of the box, SEO friendly, widely adopted, easily supported. WordPress, I think, is the way to go. And um, full disclosure, I mean, I'm, I'm an advisor to automatic WordPress.com folks. Basically, but anything but tech Tim says, he's an advisor. <laughs> has a piece no, no, no. Of <laughs> no, no, no. But I use Word, that only happened in the last few months. I've been, I've been using WordPress forever. And uh, the blog, a couple of examples that you can look at. 
uh, right now, this moment, the Smitten Kitchen Cookbook. Top of the charts. It is top of the charts. And that came out of a blog. It's a good example. Bakerella also, so bakerella.com, like cake pops. Who popularized that? Like boom, huge, like cultural gestalt or uh, zeitgeist, I think is the proper word. Automated German. Um, is uh, another example, blog to book. Uh, but there are a lot, there are more crappy books that come out of blogs than good books. There are a handful of good ones. Uh, because there's very, they're, they're not all content goes from super short form to long form well. Right. Cooking does, right? Like photographs, recipes, that's the same as in a cookbook. You're just doing one recipe at a time as opposed to an entire book. That works. But you take a bunch of like mediocre blog posts and try to put it into a 300 page book, it very frequently does not turn out very well. And uh, I think that many people who are good at writing 500, 750 word pieces, and that's a skill, are not they don't have the proper hard wiring or the interest to write something that is 150, 200 pages. Words. It's a different beast. You know what I mean? It's a different beast altogether. So, cool. I have a, I have a question. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so I'll, we'll close on this question, which this is the my, my, my question, which is obviously we're looking at tech and where things are going in the future. Yeah. To me, where I've been wanting books to go for years, yeah. uh, but I feel like stuck by it. So I'm going to ask you this question then, okay? Okay. Um, which is, I always dream like the future of me writing books is there's me and there's a designer programmer. Yeah. And I'm creating an awesome book where you turn the page and maybe that sound, because in a book you're trying to draw people into a world. So you can create something where you turn the page and you feel that sound. Yeah. Maybe whatever, if you're writing fiction, maybe the leaves just drop over that mm -hmm. page as you're reading it. And you hear the sound of the blowing, you feel that, you should make, bring people further because it's that escapism you want to bring people into that world. Yeah. Now the thing is, you can do that now with, 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 with iBooks and things, and mm -hmm. they're moving toward that. Mm -hmm. um, but with the Kindle, you're stuck with kind of the e-ink, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't really, and most, most digital books are yeah. on Kindle. Mm -hmm. And again, I think 50% of the market is still, I think, print yeah. books. So, you know, what do you, do you think, is it worth yeah. sitting there to sort of design an immersive digital yeah. book experience? Yeah. Um, and will it ever get there? So I'll answer the first, I guess I think it'll get there. Uh, this is, going to be a bloodbath in the next few years. Right. Because all of these businesses that were previously separa separate, Apple, Google, Amazon, they're just, <laughs> they're all trying to do the same thing, right? right. So Amazon has Kindle Fire HD, right? right. Like, going to compete against the iPad. Right. But they're cutting back the margins because they want to actually sell the content. Right. As opposed to the hardware. I mean, I'm not speaking for Amazon, but that's, that's just the sort of popular perception. And for me, at least, my, so part of what was fun for me, like with the 4-Hour Chef, right, it's the first time I've ever had full color. Right. Thousands of photos, right. illustrations, Calvin and Hobbes cartoon on one page, supermodel in full color on the other, like, awesome, great, right. something right. for everybody. And I had so much fun creating something that was physically beautiful. I want to take it another step. Yeah, exactly. Like, I want to have that, like, world-class designer who's not, like, juggling 20 projects. Right. But, like, the world-class designer and then the world-class, like, interaction design programmer. Right. Just be like, oh, let's think up something that's never been done. Right, and that's the author now. You'll have that team. Yeah, yeah. That's, th that's my I, dream. I think that there's a very good chance you're going to have, like, these big publishers and it's just going to splinter into these, like, publisher creators. Right. Who have these independent teams. But pra pragmatically speaking... A lot of people don't have the interest or perhaps the, a, the ability to run a business. So I think there will be many different shops that offer those types of services, which right. they're all, they, they exist already. A lot of them are being bought by places like Random House or right. Amazon or, or, or what have you. So I think you know, publishing's never been more exciting, man. It's, right. But uh, the Ian Kindle dominates the market, so you really can't it does. It does. do that on that. Well, it dominates the market, but my feeling is... When people look at, let's say, we're getting a little off track, but I'll right. take it just like another minute or two. I think, I think you're honest interested in where things are going Yeah, yeah, no, but it's like, well, so, so if you're for, writing, you're probably not yeah, getting booked no, no, up for five years. Yeah, yeah, yeah but for instance, anyway, so. it's like, I, yeah. I love certain bookstores. Like, there's a right. bookstore called Omnivore Books in right. San Francisco. It's all cookbooks. Right. They will survive for a long, long time because right. they have expertise, relationships with authors that nobody else has. Yeah. Right? So it's like, I don't have anything against independent bookstores. So a lot of people see, like, Amazon, they're like, oh, Tim Ferriss wants to, like, you know, throw... Kindles like Ninja Stars and all of the independent booksellers and right. kill them. It's like, no, I don't have any. It's not that. It is a market driven business. Like, if the customers find something more convenient, they're going to choose that. Right. If they find it less expensive, they're going to choose it. Right. And so there's this sort of tsunami of, of demand that's driving things towards digital. But I think it'll take many different formats. 
Yeah. And I, I, I don't know where that will go, but I think at the end of the day, more things stay the same than change. Yeah, I agree. So it's I was like, talking to a musician today and 50% of his sales are still CDs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like you need to be, at least in writing to me, you need to be able to tell a story. Right. Whether it's nonfiction or fiction, you need to be able to tell a story. And you can look at, let's say, the Stanford D School has some really interesting free online material for story arcs, things like that. Uh, Joseph Campbell, right. uh, so who was brought in, by the way, also, I think he was brought in by George Lucas himself to help craft the story arc of the first three Star right. Wars. Uh, if you learn to tell a story, you'll be able to write books, sell more things, create more businesses, <laughs> have a mating advantage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, you, and, like, you need to be able to captivate attention. And, and the truth is this, like, I, here, I'll tell you the last quick thing, and then we'll go, you got the internet is getting mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> the internet loves you. We just yeah. got to go to break. <laughs> okay. Go so, for it, go so for it. Uh, um, last, last thing is, uh, is oh, that, yeah, the, that people, a lot of people want to write how-to books, and, I, and it's interesting, I did the game, and then, which was really a story, and then yeah. rules of the game, which, which is the how-to part of it. And the game, by far, not only sold better, but taught people more. Yeah. And that the brain, yeah. through storytelling, the brain learns through metaphor and through storytelling. Bullet a list of 10 things to do, though we want that because we're really in that quick information time now, does not teach us. It's stories and metaphors that, yeah. that teach us. Yeah, a great, just one example of that. Uh, one, of my, one of my friends, great writer, A.J. Jacobs, writes for Esquire, does a lot right. of these crazy experiments also, hysterical guy. I actually, <laughs> first time I talked to him, he was writing a book called The Year of Living Biblically, which taught me more about religion than any other, like, serious book I'd ever right. read. But uh, the how to outsource your life portion, this like 10 page thing in the four hour work week was from him. He wrote it in Esquire. And at the time he tells the story in one of his later books. He's like, <laughs> if I had known, I would have asked for money. He's like right. some guy, blah, 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 supplement company. He's like, yeah, whatever, fine, use it. <laughs> right. But uh, AJ Jacobs also is a good example of how to teach a lot without seeming like you're teaching a lot yeah. in a way. Uh, cool. Yeah, so, so yeah, I think my last message, because we've been talking a lot about writing, is just do, you, you get one shot at life, and, when, you know, and you, you, just, you have to do what you love and what you care about, what you're passionate about, and we all know plenty of rich people who are miserable. Yep. So it's like just freaking, you know, ask yourself that question now. If there's anything you can get out of this, is what would I be doing if I didn't get paid for it and yeah. do that? Yeah. If love you're good it. enough at it, you'll eventually get paid for it. Yeah. Love cool. it. All right, cool. thank you. All that right. is a fabulous right. place awesome. to end, Neil. Thank you so much.